Caleb, the fighting senior citizen this morning. So I want to start off with uh, 20 signs that you're getting old. <laughs> Number one, you're asleep, but others worry that you're dead. Number two, your back goes out more often than you do. Number three, you're trying to quit, or, or you're trying to hold your stomach in. Wait, let me rephrase that. You quit trying to hold your stomach in no matter who walks into the room. Number four, you buy a compass for the dash of your car, the truck. Number five, you're proud of your lawnmower. Number six, your arms are almost too short to read the newspaper. Number seven, you sing along with elevator music. Number eight, you'd rather go to work than stay home sick. Number nine, you enjoy hearing about other people's operations. <clears throat> Number ten, you no longer think of speed limits as a challenge. <laughs> Number 11, people call at 9 p.m. and ask, did I wake you? <laughs> Number 12, you answer a question with, because I said so. <laughs> Number 13, the, the end of your tie doesn't come anywhere near the top of your pants. <laughs> Number 14, you take a metal detector to the beach. Huh? Number 15, you know what the word equity means. Number 16, you, you can't remember the last time that you laid on the floor to watch television. 17, your ears are hairier than your head. 18, you get into a heated argument about pension plans. 19, you got cable just for the weather channel. 20, you're sitting in a rocker and you can't get it started. <laughs> oh, I just thought that was funny. Well, I have a story to tell you today, a great story about an old man. It's found in Joshua. So if you have your, if you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua chapter 14. And uh, as you're turning there, uh, and you're looking that up to read along, let me review a little bit from the book of Joshua prior to what we're going to read today. The first half of the book is, is full of stories of God leading His people, the Israelites, into the Promised Land. It started with the miraculous crossing of the Jordan River, and then it continued as the Israelites fought and claimed the land. Chapter 10 and 11 summarize the military campaign. Chapter 12 is a, a simple list of all the kings that the Lord's army had defeated, and, and it wraps up pretty much the first half of the book. Now, the second half of the book of Joshua, it focuses on the division of the land and how it was allocated to the various tribes of Israel. And so we, we aren't going to uh, spend time in those historical details, though there are certainly some good lessons for us in those archives. But instead, we're just going to pull out a, a couple of the stories that are tucked in around those records. <clears throat> and so, the first story is found in chapter 14 of Joshua. Uh, we're going to be, begin reading in verse 6 through 15. And let me turn there. It says this. It says, <clears throat> Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gibel, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was forty years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me, made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance 
and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as He said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here, I am this day 85 years old. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then. So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. From you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. And maybe that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed them and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of the Hebron formerly was Kirjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. That's a lot, right? A lot that we read there. For some of you, it may be difficult to understand, and I really want you to understand this story. So first, what we want to do is look at the background. At first glance, this story doesn't seem too remarkable. Just another leader showing up and asking for his allotment of the land. But if we dig a little bit and, and understand the background, the uniqueness really starts to shine through. Uh, the story of Caleb begins 45 years earlier in the time of Moses. And Caleb was one of the original 12 spies sent into the promised land by Moses. Uh, the ones who spent 40 days in the promised land spying out the land and its inhabitants in order to report back to Moses and the people about what they would face when they entered. And so, if you recall that story, it's found in Numbers, the 12 spies returned, and then they reported to all the people. They said, we, we went into this land uh, to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But... The people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. And so as a result of this report, the people were terrified. They were just scared to death, and they did not believe that God could deliver the land to them safely. And so they rebelled against the Lord, and, and, and were consequently sent back out into the desert for 40 years. Until all the unbelievers died. And Joshua took over and he brought the new generation into the promised land. Now, not all 12 spies agreed with this proposed course of action. Two of them, which were Joshua and Caleb, they dissented. And they tried to encourage the people to have faith and to believe in God's promise. Numbers 13.30 reports Caleb silenced the people before Moses and he said this, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the ten without faith, they stirred up the people with these horror stories of the land, creating fear and creating disbelief, and so they rebelled. There's one other critical detail in the report of the spies that illuminates the story that we find in Joshua 14. In reporting on the inhabitants of the land, the spies, they proclaimed to Moses, we even saw descendants of Anak living there. The people of great size, these giants. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Now, who were these descendants of Anak? Well, it's difficult to recreate exactly, but Numbers tells us that the descendants of Anak came from a people called the Nephilim. We find them first mentioned in the book of Genesis, where it tells us uh, 
they were the hero, heroes of old, men of renown. And it's likely they have even had some supernatural lineage as, they, as that same verse tells us that the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. But whatever the origins, we know that when Moses sent the spies into the land, they saw the descendants of Anna still in the land. And they were strong, and they were fearsome, and they were large. The spies felt like grasshoppers before them. Now, let's look at the meat of the story. Fast forward 45 years. Here's Caleb, now 85 years old, having survived the, the 40 years wandering in the desert and having fought alongside Joshua as they took the promised land. And he has come to claim the promise of God. <coughs> Verse 6 through 9, uh, we find Caleb uh, laying out the facts, reminding Joshua that Caleb had been faithful and that he followed God even when all others had not. Then in verse 9, Caleb claims the promises uh, that Moses had made to him and his descendants because of his faithfulness. So let's read verse 9, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Having laid the groundwork, Caleb makes his request. And so I love verse 10. Go ahead and put verse 10 up there. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive as he said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, here I am this day, 85 years old. Caleb reports his age, and he's getting up there in years. 85 is pretty old. Caleb has proven his faithfulness. He has served the Lord for his entire life. And now it's time to claim the promise of God made to him through Moses. Now let me pause there for just a moment. Wouldn't we understand if Caleb was a little too tired? Wouldn't it make sense for him to retreat to the background a little bit more? Let the young, exuberant warriors take over, retire to a nice a uh, senior citizen's tent city and live out the rest of his days playing canasta, sipping iced tea with his feet in a pool and telling stories about how hard those years were in the desert. We sort of expect Caleb to continue on from verse 10 by saying, yes, I'm 85 years old now and the Lord had promised me some land to settle in. And he knows I've earned it and so this needs to be the next priority for your soldiers, Joshua. Send them up right away and clear the way for me and my descendants. You know, fight off all the bad guys and tell them to make sure that the pool is clean and the iced tea is cool. I'll wait over here and my lazy boy until they're finished. But as I read earlier, that's not what Caleb said. Listen to it again. Let's, let's read verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. And in verse 12, Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. So, instead of wanting to retire, Caleb wants to stay in the game. He still has his health, he still has the energy, and he still has the desire. And he picks the biggest battle. 
That is the part of the story that really excites me. Here is this senior citizen taking on giants. He says, give me this hill country with the Anakites in their large fortified cities. The Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Instead of sitting back at the end of his life, Caleb takes on the biggest challenge of all. So what do we learn from this story? If you have your worship guide inside, it's some notes on the back of your insert. And number one, what we learn is we're never done till God takes us home. Amen. Never done till God takes us home. I believe that as long as God gives us breath, there is something He still wants for us. Maybe it's to know Him more. Maybe it's to worship Him more. Maybe it's to continue to use the gifts that God has given to you to serve His kingdom. Listen, Billy Graham, 82 years old, he planned this big crusade out in Texas. He had no plans to retire, no plans to stop doing the things God had called him to do. Caleb was 85, and he took on the biggest enemy in the promised land. This tells me that it doesn't matter how old you are. You could be 10, 30, 50, or 100. As long as you have life, God has something for you. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what that is. That's for you and God. But what I do want to, to affirm is that God isn't finished with you until the moment he takes you home. And then number two is this. God has been preparing you for today's task your whole life long. In many ways, Caleb was the perfect person to lead the fight against the giants. He had the most experience. He had seen the most battles. And he spent 45 years waiting for this opportunity. This reminds me of, this reminds me that whatever we face today, God has been preparing us for it. I take comfort from this. I draw strength from the realization that whatever hurdles I face, God has been preparing and equipping me to meet. Whatever hurdles I face, God has been preparing and equipping me to meet. He is in control. He knows what He's doing. And He will walk with me to handle the situations of life that I face. It's always difficult in the midst of challenging situations to see how God has been preparing us for that situation and then later to see how that situation prepares us for the next. And that's why I like to talk about how God is in control. How He is the manager of the universe. And how I know that He is good. It gives me strength, hope, and the ability to try to relax in God's promises. Then number three. You might have to wait 45 years to see God's promise. And even then you might have to get in and fight for it. Taylor waited 45 years to experience the promise of God come true in his life. We know from the story that he never forgot the words God said to him through Moses. And that when the time was right, he stepped forward to claim the promise. Do you have that patience to wait for God's timing to keep his promises? I love how Caleb was active in his claim the promise of God, and I'm challenged by it. I don't know about you, but I often want to claim the promises of God like gifts from Santa. Things that just show up in my life without any effort on my part. 
Caleb models for us this opposite approach. To claim the promises of God by acting like there is nothing that will stand in the way of God keeping those promises. It didn't matter that he was 85 years old. It didn't matter that the Anakites were the biggest and most intimidating opposition in the promised land. All that mattered to Caleb was that God had made a promise. So Caleb grabbed his sword and he headed off to the hills to defeat them. This is great faith. To act on the promises of God before we see the evidence of their fulfillment. It's great faith. To stand up and say, God has promised this, so I'm going to live it. For example, God promised in Matthew 7, 7 that those who seek Him will find Him. He promised that when we have opportunity to, to share our faith, if we simply just open our mouths, His Spirit will put the words on our lips. So that's found in Mark 13, 11. In John 8, 32, He promised to teach us the truth and to set us free by that truth. Sometimes the promises appear instantly and without any action on our part. But more often, I believe, we have to act in faith. We have to act in faith in order to see the fullness of God's promises in our life. We have to act in faith in order to see the fullness of God's promises in our lives. Like Caleb, we have to march off into battle. And we are to claim God's promises of victory. <clears throat> so, let's just see how this story ends. If you can go over to Joshua 15, chapter 15, verse 13 through 17. You might be wondering how this battle turned out. But we can read the answer. Let's read uh, Joshua 15, 13 through 17. It says, Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirjath Ar, which is Hebrew. Arba was the father of Anak. Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shisha, Haman, and Telai, the children of Anak. Then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Debir, formerly the name of Debir was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kirjath Sefer and takes him to him, I will give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it and gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. You see, God was faithful. After 45 years, and with a soldier who was 85 years old, the mighty giants were destroyed. Now, the challenge to us, never underestimate what God can do through someone older than you. Respect those who are older. Learn and lean on their experiences. They fought a lot of battles and they can save you a lot of energy, a lot of injury and mistake. If only you won't be too proud to seek them out and ask for their input. To the old or older, know that God isn't finished with you until He calls you home. Actively claim the promises of God. Will you fight the toughest battles now? <coughs> and what are those, you wonder? They are the battles fought in prayer. So I ask you to pray. Pray for our teens, our children, the kids in our student ministry, and teen kid, and our families in our community. I ask you to pray for our church leaders and the pastoral staff. I ask you to pray for the parents of our young people. 
I ask you to pray for our children's ministry teachers. Most of all, again, will you pray for this community? Pray that the love of Jesus might break through the resistance and bring life to those who don't know Jesus. As I think about what the, the modern equivalent of the Anakites might be and how to fight the giants of today, I recognize that the battles are only going to be fought and won in prayer. Amen. And that is why I ask you, those of you who are seniors, to pray. As we wrap this up, I read about a, a memorial service for someone's dad. And I've never met him in person, but as his family and friends share about his life, I got a picture of how God had really worked in his life in his later years. It seemed like God had really gotten a hold of him and recreated him and made him new all after he retired. There were numerous stories of how God had used him in a mighty way as a senior citizen. Stories of influencing young people, working for reconciliation, seeing gifts of generosity multiply 30-fold. He reminded me a lot of Caleb. Claiming God's promises and fighting alongside God in his later years. I was incredibly encouraged by this celebration of life and reminded that God honestly doesn't care how old we are. He cares that our hearts are His and that He is the focus of our lives. Amen. And when that is the case, it doesn't matter what giants we face. God will be victorious. Amen? Amen. Well, if Brother David can start making his way up. And, uh, I want to challenge all of us to take a stand. And I want to challenge all of us to commit to pray for our community and for our nation. Our nation has really lost our way. And we've really fallen away from God. And so, we're going to get ready to sing this worship hymn, Trust and Obey. And I want to challenge you, would you trust and obey? Would you pray for our nation? And as we sing, be thinking about this challenge to pray. Even if you want to come forward, there's a lot of room here because we've cleared it all out for Easter. If you want to make your way down here and say, you know what? I commit to pray for our nation every day, each and every day. And also, as we sing, I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'll be waiting right here for you. Come on down. I'd love to share that with you. Or if you want to be baptized, or if you want to become a member of this church, I want to invite you to come. We're going to sing Trust and Obey. If you need prayer for anything, or if you want to step up to the plate and take this challenge, meet me down here. When we start to sing, you come.